Welcome to the Layman Seminary. Today, what I'm going to be doing is, uh, to, I have this debate at eight at eight p.m. Central, and uh, I need to walk through my PowerPoint. I have way too much stuff, and I need to narrow it down. And so, this is just going to be like a, a a reading to get, you know, that I hopefully I can get clarity in that area. So, as you can see, I'm debating Lucas Curcio. He's a Methodist. Um, believes you can lose your salvation. And uh, so, yeah, here we go. So in preparation, I'm, I mainly watched uh, this debate between this Calvinist. And this was an in-person debate, so that was kind of interesting. At Apologia uh, Church. Now, in times past, I've used this chart right here to talk about the different views of salvation, you know, and... Uh, um, Basically, it sounds like he holds the voluntary security. In other words, the saved will remain saved unless they reject salvation by their own free choice. So he's actually what some might call moderate Arminianism. All right. So I'm going to argue that free grace is biblical because it takes the promises seriously of the Bible. You know, in other words, that focuses on eternal security, right? And uh, uh, it also takes the warning passages seriously. And yet that's usually the complaint of the Armenian is you all are not looking at the warning passages. Those warning passages are referring to believers. And you know what? I agree. But they're not talking about loss of salvation. It's either loss of rewards, inheritance, loss of life, loss of something else. Um, and the reason uh, it's biblical is because it has an answer for all the passages uh, in addition to it being biblical, it has all the answers for uh, the passages that your previous opponent did not address. And so I'm going to, because because he brought up a lot of passages in the very beginning, and not all of them were addressed that I could see. All right, I'm going to make mention to him of Final Destiny, because I want more people of higher caliber to start challenging these resources, because I wanted to see if they could stand up to scrutiny. And uh, so that's whenever the last draft was made of that. So this was my last debate, except for my eschatology debate that I had on replacement theology. And in this, I feel like that it showed that our position had greater ex explanatory power. And you can go back and watch the previous debates we had with both of the guys as well. Um, so I got this slide here. I don't know if I'm going to use it. But um, in that in that the two on two debate, I brought up this David Anderson's argument against Scott McKnight that Scott McKnight hated the reform approach of temporary faith, and so, but yet he assumed that Matthew twenty four thirteen assumed perseverance. Now, um, Lucas is premillennial; he's historical premillennial, so I'm not sure exactly how he takes Matthew twenty four thirteen. But if he doesn't take it that way, then that may that may help him to be able to see passages a little bit differently. But because Scott McKnight uh, assumed perseverance from that passage, he argued for what was called phenomenological belief. In other words, the people appear to be saved and therefore the authors are addressing them as if they are saved. Um, he also assumed only Joshua and Caleb were saved from the Old Testament generation. Then... He assumed Hebrews 10, 26 referred to hell, which um, Lucas does too, I believe. And uh, he avoided the arguments that deal with the idea that this is talking about temporal curses and fellowship issues. So this is the David Anderson article that's mentioned there. And this is where he says the 1992 McKnight addressed the warning passages. This is the Trinity Journal, vo uh, volume 13, where Scott McKnight's article about the warning passages of Hebrews is mentioned here. Here's, a, uh, um, I think it's Tom Schreiner, his response, a little bit different about Scott McKnight. And then this is just a reminder that uh, um, I do believe that the Old Testament saints of the Exodus generation were believers. In fact, I made this video, uh, the four types of salvation in Exodus. This is the sermon version of that. And so uh, Hebrews 10, 26 and 39, basically, this is a key passage that that Lucas brought up 
And uh, we're going to examine this in more detail. Um, and so he, he rightly made the connection in Numbers 15, but he's still assuming that this is talking about atonement for salvation. And I think he's assuming it's fire as hell. Um, but in Deuteronomy 4, 26, I mean, 24, he said, for the Lord, your God is a consuming fire. And then in 26, when it's talking about going over the land to possess it, you should not live longer on it, but will be utterly destroyed. And so this is talking about, um, I call heaven earth against you day that you will surely perish quickly from the land where you're going over the Jordan to possess it. You should not let it live on it, but it will be utterly destroyed. So he's he's reminding them that if you fall into idolatry and do all this stuff, you'll be you'll receive divine discipline. And you'll be receive temporal judgment. What's so significant is this word right here, as you see from the Septuagint, apaleia, apaleste, the 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 noun form and the verb form uh, intensified there is that's what it means by utterly destroyed, and uh, um, in Hebrews. Uh, ten thirty nine, uh, it says for destruction, and so that's what we're that's what we're talking about. Um, uh, we are not of those who draw back. I think that's what it is. I have to look. Um, in Malachi four one, when it's talking about Christ coming back, the Messiah, it's talking about temporal judgment that He brings, and it's burning and blaze, and there's ashes under the feet. So here's some passages that. Uh, here's a, a footnote actually that says this. It's kind of interesting here. Interpreters who object to the warning in Hebrews 10 as being a temporal judgment instead of eternal speak of the much worse judgment to come upon believers in Christ who apostatize as opposed to the judgment who came upon the unfaithful Israelites of Kadesh Barnea. And then he says, however, they overlook the fact that a judgment which affects one's rest in the millennium a thousand years is much worse than a judgment which one affects one's rest in the land for 40 years. Okay, so going into the journal, here's the Manite stuff where he's making his arguments. Um, I don't think I really need to include this um, information here. So I'll probably cut that or just leave it there and go through it. So he's talking about how he understands the passage. Uh, he take eternal damnation, and this is a this is a chart that I used in my last debate, basically to argue that um, eternal life is primarily qualitative and experiential. John seventeen three, this is eternal life, and so within the Trinity, God is viewed as a per, a, per, a perfect parent who brings divine discipline. Uh, blessings and curses that are mentioned in Deuteronomy 28 and 29 uh, are, are a demonstration of that. In Deuteronomy 30, when it's talking about choose life, uh, set before you life and death, choose life. This is a metonymy, uh, a figure of speech that substitutes or represents these blessings and the curses. So blessings is life and cursing is death. And so anytime we come to a passage, it's a warning or encouragement. Uh, I believe that it's the tip of the iceberg and that all of this is involved here. So true biblical salvation begins with an event that sets a process in motion that God brings to completion with the event of a death, rapture, and resurrection. True biblical salvation is eternally preserved based on the event of the person believing the gospel called positional faith. Positional faith is also a positional obedience since one obeys the command to believe the gospel at that one point in time. A positional faith is also a positional work since it's an activity a person is responsible to do. And see, this is pulled from my Travis Thomas debate because uh, he believes he could lose salvation, of course. So here's those categories, positional faith, positional obedience, positional work. I got to explain the chart at some point to orient the people. True biblical salvation is eternal preservation based on positional truth that cannot be reversed. No experiential truth can be conflated with positional truth, and the experiential column cannot undo or disprove the positional truth column. To simplify the debate, I will usually take experiential column for most passages as a default. This is to explore the limits of the explanatory power with each debate. So positional faith is biblically compared to one look at the bronze serpent in John 
3, 14 through 16. As the comparison, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. He only lifted it up once. Uh, even so, and they only had to look at it once. So the son of man be lifted up. So that whoever believes in him will have everlasting life. So it's compared to that. And then the 16 starts with a four because it's explaining that. Uh, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, so as you run, as we're running through this idea of the chart, you know, these are examples here of things you can do. You even got a prepositional category um, that you can run things through. This one was for Church of Christ. This is an overview of kind of like how my chart works, some subcategories. And basically, whenever I'm coming to a passage, essentially what we're doing is we're asking this question. Does every process begin with an event? Yes. Does it involve a process? If, in other words, if a passage involves a process, yes. So that means there's an applied event. So who wins the process in one event? Well, God ultimately does. Okay, this slide is one that I demonstrated that uh, you have necessary results uh, at salvation, uh, positionally and experientially while you're in fellowship with God. Um, positional salvation results in positional union and automatically places you into fellowship until the next moment you sin. Um, this is something I'll probably throw forward in the debate uh, that basically, you know, uh, this is from Second Peter 2 debate with Crimson, that you have A, B, and C truth. A truth, if, usually if you take a passage like Second Peter 2, that would be the view that uh, this is one of the passages that Lucas brought up. That would be the view that they never believed. Okay. So they were never positionally saved. But uh, the B truth, which is the one I argued for, is that they're saved, but they're ensnared to false teaching. And see, that's the thing is, is that whenever you debate free grace, you have to disprove both positions. And that's what makes it so difficult. That's what I just said right there. In order to, and then you must prove conditional security in addition to that. So this is an example here that you have irreversible positional transformation, but your walk is reversible, you know, things like that. Different charts here that will come up, you know, this is basically to explain what it means about the former and the latter. In other words, the beginning of your sancti sanctification walk versus uh, the latter state that a person is in at that time. All right. So, yeah, so this is explaining positional truth. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to use this. This this describes different aspects of eternal life, position, experience, and ultimate, the qualitative aspect. Um, here's a passage from First Peter that was brought up in the debate. As you have positional has caused us to be born again, right? Who are protected by the power of God through faith. And so the Calvinists would say, well, that's because God gives us to get the faith that we persevere. The Armenian says, oh, well, we got to, we got to, continue to have faith in order to be protected and i'm saying no this passage is just experiential in other words it's saying that you're not protected by the power of god if you're not uh trusting in him and then the salvation ready reveal in the last time is the ultimate salvation and then four it says obtaining the inheritance is perishable reserved in heaven for you so the glorified body as well as other things related to that so i'll probably end up um putting that forward here's a couple other uh, words and stuff that came up in the two by two debate that i could just show you know uh, the fact uh, effects of how we can run it through the chart um so this would be lucas the opponent part so salvation is for the believing one that's his assertion okay my position it salvation is for the one who believed at one point in time meaning you can stop believing See, Lucas is arguing that there's a process here because he wants to argue for a continual belief that you have to continually believe in order to remain saved. And I say this, that there's an explicit or implicit point in time that began the process. So whether a passage is, is explicitly talking about position or if it's implicitly given a process, that implies that that process has been set into motion by an event. Uh, Lucas said in the debate, he talks about the verbs that are in the present tense. Well, 
we need to prop we, we need there's a proper way to evaluate and interpret verbs and verbals. Um, so Lucas was focused on the reality. He was always asking questions about reality and he was focused on time. But when you're dealing with the languages, actually what you're dealing with is the portrayal route of reality and not necessarily time. So the question is, is the condition to continuously believe? And then this is what I say. How could the condition to continuously believe be met unless one first begins to believe at a point in time? In other words, it's like a train that's going by you but never stops. If it never stops, if it continuously goes by, you can't ever get on the train. So faith has to have a beginning point, and that's positional. One must, so he would say, one must continue in the state of belief uh, in this process to remain saved. And what I say is God will not force you to continue this process of experiential sanctification. Lucas would say belief is a position that can be fallen from. He calls it positional contingency. Well, I have a term I call positional belief. But keep in mind, belief is the instrument that takes one to one's position. So you can think of like a rocket ship that takes you positionally out of this world. Okay. Now, I know the metaphor it's forensically, judicially, um, substitution, those ideas there. But I, I think there's grounds for this positionally out of this world. Uh, so you can experientially choose to live in this world, you know, as a sojourner or a pilgrim or someone visiting or whatever. Um, but if you choose not to live on this world, it doesn't change the fact that you've been given dual citizenship. You know, that's what it argues in Philippians is that that they have the citizenship of heaven and all of that. And so positionally, we have our citizenship in heaven regardless of whether we represent a, as a good citizen would on earth. Okay, so Lucas basically is arguing that belief has the same object and content for both positional salvation and sanctification. I'm arguing that positional belief is one moment for God as a moment of a belief in God as the positional savior. In other words, positional belief is you're believing in him for, to be saved you from the penalty of imputed sin. Okay? Expert, and Lucas would say uh, experiential belief is a condition for receiving ultimate salvation. What I would say is experiential belief is a moment-by-moment -moment choice to decide to believe God and his word or not. In other words, God is the experiential sanctifier. So positional belief takes you to a unique state as an instrument. But experiential belief differs in content, so it cannot reverse positional belief. That's the whole point. So even if you say, well, the object is God, okay, but the content, what one knows about the object or what one's looking towards for salvation uh, and when you get initially saved is not the same thing that you're looking for in your walk. Exactly the same thing. Okay, so this is a cliche, but I think it's true. What has been done in eternity cannot be reversed by what has been done in time. Okay, therefore, moving from, should be from, not form, from belief to unbelief does not cause one to lose one's salvation. Remember, faith is the vehicle that places you in a new position. If you stop having faith, right, let's just say, this might be weird, but let's just say you get in the rocket and the rocket takes you to the space station or the new colony or whatever, right? Where you're going to be a new citizen, but then the rocket blows up, all right? Doesn't change the fact that you're still there on that space station, regardless of whether you, uh, even though the rocket has been destroyed. So unbelief does not reverse the belief, the vehicle that took you to the position. And then somebody might, and he may say, but that violates free will. This is what I'll say to that. By our own will, we choose to get on the rocket ship that took us to another realm. And some choices have irreversible consequences. 
for example, uh, having a child and things like that. All right. So Lucas is going to emphasize the continuous nature of the tenses, right? And so my question is, whenever he makes statements like salvation is for the believing one, is this based on the substantive of participle? And this is significant because I've written my paper on this, and this is the constant thing that's brought up both by Calvinists and Arminians. And a lot of times what happens is people make a dogmatic position on the Greek. But the thing to understand is that it's a, this, I think this is a debated position, you know, and I'm going to try to explore that a little bit. You know, Lucas is going to try to focus on time and action where I'm going to bring up the issue. OK, we need to talk about action start, which is kind of action and verbal aspect, which is more like viewpoint. So for action start. Uh, Lucas is going to talk about he he'll basically if he uses these terms or not he's taking things as customary habitual because he got the present tense but you also have the gnomic and others you know for so that's like a timeless fact you know so he's present tense focus but another issue you run into is wait a minute if 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 your argument is always on the present tense focus then why is the aorist tense also used for belief in other passages um so there's two papers one of them was called the abused heiress and now there's another one called the abused present that i recommend people read so basically lucas in his debate with uh daniel the reform guy put greek on the table well you could look at it like what i'm doing right now is taking it off the table or in other words, so that it levels the playing field. No one is saying, okay, and my argument is true because of Greek, you know. Or it could be looked at as I'm putting more Greek on the table. I'm saying we need to explore these things a little bit more. We, there, it isn't the end of the discussion. We got to go deeper into that. And so he's got to make a choice. You know, does he want to dive into this language stuff in this debate or go to something else? So in my debate with Travis Thomas, uh, one of his passages of objection was 1 Timothy 1, 18 and 20 about faith being shipwrecked. Same objection that Lucas brought up. And this is what I say. Travis used 1 Timothy to argue that to be shipwrecked means to lose salvation. But the metaphor may be built on Paul's life and Paul survived shipwreck. Also, how do they learn not to blasphemy? It didn't say, so you will learn. Also, this phrase is similar to 1 Corinthians 5, which is another passage you probably take as a proof text for loss of salvation. But if you want to abandon the context and jump there, at least weigh in on this passage. That's what I was telling him. Travis, and then another one is, Travis uses 2 Timothy 4.10 to argue that salvation could be lost because it's talking about Demas had forsaken Paul. Uh, but did he forsake the Lord? Even if he forsakes the Lord, why do you think you can lose your salvation? What has been done in our temporal life cannot reverse what has been done in eternity. While one enters into a new realm from time, time cannot reverse that. Once a citizen of God's space station, always, even if you sojourn to earth. If I tell you, if you boarded my vessel, that you will reach your destination, that's a promise guaranteed. If you affirm my ability and act like a good passenger, then you join my fleet. And this is a promise of future reward of future service. But if you deny my ability to do this or act like a bad passenger, I will also deny you the opportunity to be rewarded for trusting me. This is a promise of loss of reward of future service. But regardless of all of this, I am faithful to all my promises as captain. Okay. So here's how this, the very same metaphor um, or illustration relates to the chart. So you see the guarantee for a position. If I tell you, if you board in my vessel, that you will reach your destination. That's the promise that's guaranteed. So the experiential determines whether you're going to be rewarded or, or demerited. But regardless of that, one's faithful to promises. And so, of course, this is the passage. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we dare, he will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So uh, 
I, I, when I was writing my notes for Lucas, I was like, what passage makes you think if you stop believing, you're no longer saved? Well, one of the ones he brought up in the debate was 1 Corinthians 15, 2. And I've written a paper on that, okay? I agree with them that a warnings are for, for believers. And uh, he takes falling away to be from the eternal, eternal life, his position. And I say, you can fall away temporarily, but eternally, no. He says there's no need to fear truth and that we should adjust the presuppositions. In the same way, that's what I want him to do in this debate is adjust his presuppositions. And the best way to do that is run everything through the chart. He points to John 640 where he's assuming that it's continuous belief as a condition. But once again, um, it could be gnomic, a timeless truth principle or is the passage even positional? You know, I kind of take John 6 as all experiential. And then it mentions about the passage about raise him up. And he takes that as referring to final salvation. But if it's experiential, then what about the idea that it's related to rewards and rank rather than salvation? Now, I haven't thought about all the implications and how it affects other passages, but these are just observational thoughts that I have. So concerning 1 Corinthians 15, 2, you see that I have all the words that are mentioned in that passage run through there. Save, gospel, message, stand, hold fast, believe, faith, belief in vain. And you run it through the chart and we can evaluate it. Now, once again, there's the, there's the pyramid that we're going to be dealing with as we go into these passages. This is from Dillo, but it's a reminder that everybody has a typology whenever they come to books of Hebrews and other things like that. This is closer to the correct typology. So being in Egypt is like, okay, similar to like being an unbeliever. Um, but I believe the whole audience is saved. But regardless of that, the wilderness wanderings are viewed as carnal Christians. And this crossing the Jordan and all of that's related to the spiritual Christian. But the enter and rest relates to the rewarded Christian, the millennial kingdom. So you could divide it up into position, experience, and ultimate as well, okay? So here's my more extensive chart on the four views of salvation through eight events. Um, and basically what affects how you understand salvation in the Exodus generation is you got to identify the positional salvation, where you think positional salvation is. Then the rest of the passages must then be experiential uh, or beyond that. Positional salvation can occur before, after, or during temporal salvation. In other words, during temporal deliverance. Um, there's several factors about temporal deliverance, but we don't have to get into that. But, well, I could just assert it right now. For example, the Passover lamb, that's not necessarily positional salvation. It's temporal deliverance. The Red Sea crossing, that's not necessarily positional salvation. It's temporal deliverance. I believe they were already saved before then. Here's a couple passages that support the idea that they were already saved uh, that are mentioned here. And so my approach is basically to begin with the Old Testament and move forward so no one cannot accuse me of considering the context. Now, whenever I'm talking about the Old Testament background, comparing it to the book of Hebrews, the Old Testament background, you have Moses and Joshua. In the book of Hebrews, you have Jesus and the author, the we, right? Old Testament background, Hebrew believers, uh, book of Hebrews, Hebrew Christians. Old Testament background, second generation Israelites about to go into the promised land. Book of Hebrews, second generation Christians. Uh, Old Testament background, uh, first generation were underneath divine discipline and died in the wilderness. Second generation uh, are in, in danger or are under divine discipline. All right, so there's consequences in the background and there's warnings about these consequences in the book of Hebrews. So both books are dealing with divine discipline where the Old Testament is concrete metonymy. In other words, blessings and cursings were more tangible because of the covenant relationship to the theocracy. There's a more abstract metonymy going on in the New Testament. So that means when you see the word death and life, you can't... Uh, um, you could think about that there could be several different factors of divine discipline involved there in that passage. So where that's dealing with covenant for a theocracy, uh, this is dealing with the code for the church. Where this was national or theocratic, this is mainly dealing with individual. 
Okay. So in the Old Testament, the Exodus generation uh, lost rewards, but they did not physically die. Okay. And this is true for the church too. Not everybody that is disciplined by the Lord physically dies. They can lose the rewards so. though. Sometimes they don't know what they've lost until they get to heaven. But whenever they died, say temporal discipline or divine discipline, that could include the loss of future reward because I mean the loss of opportunity to gain more reward. And this is true also for the church because you have a loss of opportunity to earn rewards. Then you have Moses' loss of temporal reward because he was not able to go into the promised land. And so Christians can also lose temporal rewards. Loss of eternal reward is missed opportunities in the Messianic and Millennial Kingdom. Yeah. So if they miss if they the rewards they missed out on is willing and reigning with Christ, uh, to an extent, or whatever it's going to be like in there. And that's true for the church too. I already talked about deaths and loss of reward, and yeah. All right. So another thing is making a comparison between Deuteronomy 32 and the book of Hebrews is very significant. In 32, you have disinheritance. In Hebrews, you have the danger of it. In 32, per, uh, parenting language, in Hebrews, same thing. Uh, the Lord's inheritance, uh, 32, 9, you have the son inherits in Hebrews. You have apostasy, and, and in the book of Hebrews, you have the danger of apostasy. You have demon worship in 32.17. And possibly you have that in the book of Hebrews. I'd have to explain that. Um, but they neglected the rock of salvation, who is God. Uh, in Hebrews, they're told not to neglect so great a salvation and that they've come to the city of refuge, basically. they uh, um, God was hiding his face in displeasure in 32.17. Well, in the book of Hebrews, there's a passage that says no one will see the Lord. So it could be referred, it could be shame language. In 32, you have fire burning and consuming the land. And this is in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 as well. You have the compassion on a faithful remnant. And the same thing you see in the book of Hebrews is the author in the book and his call to faithfulness. 32, you have vengeance and how the Lord will repay. Hebrews 10 does the same thing. There's in 32, there's a warning that this judgment is not idle and that this is the life opportunity. Same thing is true for the book of Hebrews. Um, Moses was not holy in, in that sense of being disobedient, so he didn't get to see the land. And without holiness, no one would see the Lord. It could be just a reference to seeing him in approval or um, millennial disinheritance. So this is a comparison between Genesis 3.18 and the Septuagint to Hebrews 1.6. This is supporting the idea that the fire involved in the passage is not hell, but this is talking about the cursing that was similar uh, uh, upon the earth. Okay, This is where I compared Deuteronomy 28 blessings and Deuteronomy 28 cursings to Hebrews 6. I color-coded everything. So that people could see how this metonymy is working. This is the passage about choose life that establishes the metonymy. Um, same thing right here. Um, it's for the uh, for your life or death, the blessing and curse of choose life. You know, there may you live and so that your descendants also live. So this is a chart I'm probably going to remake. But basically it reminds you that positionally there's a death, an unbelieving death, right? And then there's life, positional salvation. Experientially, you can either walk in death or walk in life. And ultimately, um, death could be related to, I guess, uh, maybe loss of rewards. And life, of course, would be ruling and reigning and having a glorified body and that type of thing like that. Um, so death is experiential temporal. Life is experiential temporal. And these are the two paths that are often quoted in the path in the Bible. So a passages that support the idea of literal fire from the Old Testament, where uh, rather than assuming that it's hell or Leviticus 10, when fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, it's talking about a physical death that consumed them. Number 1635, the, the when this judgment here, they came out of fire from the Lord and consumed the 20, 
250. Deuteronomy 17, this is uh, talking about the judgment, about two or two witnesses or three witnesses that's worthy of death, right? And so it's talking about physical te uh, uh, temporal death, capital punishment. Isaiah 24, 6. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. So this is talking about the idea that the people are burned. In the words, temporal judgment, probably related to the tribulation. Isaiah 25, 9. And it shall be said in that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. That is the Lord, and we have waited for him. He will glad and rejoice in salvation. So the salvation in this passage is messianic salvation. It's temporal salvation from the Antichrist during the tribulation. Um, so this is a statement here. Um, chapters 24 and 27, Isaiah are a depiction of the coming judgment of God in the day of the Lord, which is followed by kingdom blessing. Then union begins with an announcement. Yeah, so that's Paul Ellenworth's commentary. Okay, so this is wherever I start going through the book of Hebrews and making this connection between sonship and heirship, okay? And that's talking about how Jesus is the son who is appointed heir of all things, all right? And so we can talk about when does this occur, this inheritance. He has inherited a more excellent name today. And then one five, you are my son, he shall be a son to me. But of the son, he says, you're thrown on God and his kingdom. So this is the idea of inheritance. Uh, and then right here, the angels are ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who inherit salvation. So this is not positional salvation. This is messianic salvation, the ruling and reigning, that idea there. So here's that passage there. Here's all the times that Soteria is used in the book of Hebrews related to that. I don't think any of them are talking about positional salvation. Um, here's how to take the, the warning passages. Uh, they're dealing with divine discipline, basically, all of them. Go in more detail about it. Um, so Hebrews uh, 2, 1 and 2, right, is talking about, you know, this exhortation. And it, and it talks about how should we escape with neglect so great a salvation. That's that idea there. It's the messianic salvation. Uh, the world to come is what's in view in this book, not heaven. The world to come is the messianic millennial kingdom. Um, I think it's probably age to come. I'd have to look. Son of man language is being used there. Hebrews 2.10 it, um, is talking about the reward and taste and death for every man. What Christ did. Uh, bringing many sons to glory. The author of their salvation and not ashamed to call them brethren. So that's the idea of their believers. And the goal is glory, which I think is not just salvation, that it goes beyond that to ruling and reigning. Um, so in the view of the context of Hebrew 2, sanctify refers to positional sanctification. Verse 9 and 10 make reference to the suffering of death. He tested death for everyone. And his suffering, hence, he is a sanctifier by virtue of his death on the cross for them. That's from John Nemela. There should be no mistake that after this careful definition of brethren in chapter 2, all other references throughout the book clearly have in mind genuine believers. So this is a reminder that as you're dealing with the Genesis, I mean the Hebrews 3 and 4 passages concerning rest, that they're not talking about heaven. So you got a creation rest, an extra generation rest, a conquest generation, the Christian experience rest, and the future amazing millennial kingdom, eternal state. Um, here's some terms that are related to that. And so this is where you go down in the passages, dealing with the, the warning passages. And this is talking about the uh, the priesthood imagery and everything, because it seems conditional in the passage. Uh, but basically the idea is, is we serve in, in the capacity as priests now, and depending on that would determine how we serve in the future. Hebrews 3.1 that's the partakers of holy calling three six faithful of a son over his house whose house we are this is related to his priestly house it's not salvation if we hold fast our confidence and boast our hope firm until the end so this is not saying that you have to hold fast to remain saved it's saying if you want to be part of the, the priesthood of the son 
in the ultimate future, then you need to hold fast, persevere. Hebrews 3, 7, um, it's reminding you about the Old Testament passage about hardening your hearts in the wilderness, grieved with them and then not on my ways. Um, this is a warning passage. This fear will promise remains in a race and anyone comes short of it. This is an exhortation to keep believing in God experientially. Here's the passage pipto, which means to fall. It's used in 317, uh, Hebrews 4, 11 and 11, 30. And so in 317, and with whom he's angry for 40 years, was it not with those who sin, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? So falling in the wilderness is, is physical death, okay? Well, this word pipto for fallen is being used here. And here's some other words for it. And you notice the parapipto is another one that's translated as fallen. And we'll get to that in Hebrews 6. Uh, Hebrews 4.12, therefore, let us be diligent to enter the rest so that no one will fall uh, through following the same example of disobedience. So this is temporal judgment, divine discipline. So the, uh, the sonship idea, the son of God there, my son, priest forever, in the days of his flesh, when his ministry occurred, his sonship, just tracing that motif. And, and then 5, 9, and having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. I don't take eternal salvation as positional. I take this as experiential. And, uh, um, and we'll look at some of that. But we've already kind of dealt with the passages that talk about not seeing the Lord's face. Um, so displeasure language. But um, when we go into this, got a thing to understand is the word used for obey there is patho, okay? Um, patho is coming off on this side right here. So supposedly they have two roots, pith, and you have two Hebrew words, aman and batak, and they're not synonymous with each other. Aman has influenced pistis and pastuo, where batak has influenced uh, patho, elpizo, and elpis, in other words, hope. Um, and so these are not synonymous and we shouldn't blur the distinction. So here's patho, the range of meaning that it can refer to, to believe, to be convinced, to obey. Here's the Hebrew words to reference it to, and you can see the batak is right there. Um, here's the negative form of it, to disobey, unbelieve, and so on. Same thing as it relates to the Hebrew. So patho, uh, is not in the Gospel of John except one place in John 3.36. And this was another passage that Lucas brought up, and it's the negative form of it. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Okay? So this could, this could be a synonym for believe, or this could even be experiential like we're seeing in Hebrews. Those are options. Um... And so right here, 1 John 3, 19, we will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our hearts before him. So this is the word patho that's translated there. And so assure or persuaded our hearts is being used in that way. So the idea is, is that aman influences pastuo, where batak influences el piso, el pis, and patho. So you got to be careful not translate similar terms with different Greek words and don't blur the distinction. So this is the this is how you would map it out is that you have patho that's taking up its own semantic domain and you have pistis taking up its own semantic domain. And then this is important. Pastuo and the Septuagint can't be demonstrated to mandate continued belief or obedience. The semantic value is simple trust or confidence. When no dur de force inherit in the term, that's Fred J. The Septuagint and later development give insight into the study of the faith term in the New Testament, but only terms in the context in the New Testament can provide a definitive answer. So just keep that in mind as we're doing this study. J says you want to determine if pastuo indicates salvific belief rather than pursuing blanket categories. And so these are the videos that I've done, breaking all that down. You can see the order of them, working through Fred Chase's book. Um, and so here's some of the passages, I think, where the word is being used there. Um, yeah. Patho. Now, back into here, once again, we're dealing with uh, the warning passages. And, and you got some 
temporal salvation passages about Noah and things like that. Then you get to Hebrews 6, right? There's parapipto, fall away. And uh, Dana Harris, exegetical uh, Greek New Testament, exegetical God of Greek New Testament, 2019, it makes a discussion about this and it takes these as adjectival participles or, or substantival participles. This is significant. I've known about this for a while, probably since 2016 when I did a webinar with Todd Skaywater and he taught that. But uh, there was this article that he was pulling from John Scrolley, uh, that that is where this is uh, this argument is made, and this is the the uh, the diagram and that he does to show how the participles are working together. Five adjectival substantival participles function as direct object of anakazin. Uh, anakazin. All right. So this is for it is impossible to renew again for repentance those da, 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 da. and so that's what you have going on there so this passage about accompanying salvation this is not positional salvation um so this is about blessings inheritance that idea there um notice hebrews 10 i mean 6 10 talks about your work and then it mentions inheriting the promises so this relates to the idea this is experiential and ultimate um, rewards. So that's that passage. 617 talks about the show to the heirs of the promise, just tracing this idea of the inheritance. Even when it's talking about Christ being a mediator, it said, have been called, may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So that's being mentioned there. Okay. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin that those who eagerly wait him. So this is the second coming, in other words. Um, and uh, so that makes you wonder, does this tie to Matthew 25, about the wise and foolish versions and stuff? Um, but 1035 says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. The reason I'm showing all this inheritance of reward passages so people see that it's clearly in the context. That way, when I go into examination of Hebrews 10, they don't say, oh, well, you're you're importing something foreign to the context. Hebrews 11, 6 also says that we must believe that God is and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. Hebrews 11, 7, and it says that Noah became an heir righteous, which is according to faith. So you have that idea. He was already positionally saved whenever uh, the flood had occurred. And so uh, it's more of an experiential. Hebrews 11, talking about Abraham, he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he's going. He was lived as an alien in the land of the promise, as foreign land, dwelling in tents, fellow heirs of the same promise. Keep in mind that he's not, he's, he's dwelling as a, a, a sojourner. So has Abraham actually received the promise? Um, that's something that may be brought up in discussion. Um, 11.26, consider the approach of Christ greater riches than the treasure of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. That's talking about Moses, okay? Reward, guys. Hebrews 11.30, this is where Pepto is used again. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been circled for seven days. Hebrews 12, talking about the exhortation related to sons, and he disciplines every son whom he receives. And then for you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit a blessing, it's talking about Esau. It's not saying he's not saved. It just, he wasn't able to inherit a blessing. It was irrevocable. He couldn't reverse it. There was no place for repentance. So he started with tears. Okay, so there's the chart that we went through concerning that. I don't have to bring it up again. Um, so Deuteronomy 32 is talking about God being the rock. They have acted correctly toward him. They're not his children because of their defects. So it's, he's using disinheritance language there. Um, is he not your father who had brought you? So there's the perfect parrot imagery. Ask your father and he will inform you. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance. So you got the inheritance idea. Sons of men, sons of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. So that's the Lord's inheritance. And there was no foreign God with them. In other words, this is whenever they hadn't been in an apostate state. Um, 
And then they forsook God who made him and scorned the rock of salvation. And they made him jealous with strange gods. They sacrificed demons who were not God to God whom they not known. Um, so that supports the idea that, that a believer can worship demons and other things. Uh, you neglected the rock who begot you. Okay, Remember, how should we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Uh, I will hide my face from them. They won't, in other words, they won't see the Lord, that imagery there. For they were a first generation sons in whom there's no faithfulness. So the idea is about service and faithfulness. And this is about idolatry. Now look at this. For a fire is kindled in my anger, so divine discipline, and burns to the lowest parts of Sheol. So it, it's it's a descriptive of the intensity and consumes the earth with its yield and sets on fire the foundation of the mountain. And so this could be temporal discipline it could be physical fire but it, it, it sounds like it's in poetic aspect right now i would use my arrows on them this relates to deuteronomy 28 and 30 as well as leviticus 26 for the lord would vindicate his people i think this is related to the just shall live by faith idea and will have compassion on his servants uh look at this deuteronomy 32 41 i will render vengeance in my adversaries and i will repay those who hate me so this is talking about divine discipline um, leading to death. He said, and take to your heart all the words which I'm warning you today, right? For it is not an idle word for me, indeed. It's your life. In other words, for experiential sanctification, uh, uh, it, even physical life, you know. And he's talking about possessing rewards, um, that idea. And then he tells them to die on the mountain. Physical death is in view. Um and the reason he dies is because he broke faith, which could be a form of apostasy, if you want to say. Um, and he didn't treat the Lord as holy. Remember what it says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Well, look at this. You did not treat me as holy, for you shall see the land at a distance. In other words, without holiness, you will not see the land, the Lord, right? He got to see the land, but he don't get to see the Lord in the sense of inheritance or something. So maybe that's related to that idea. Um, so, yeah, we just went through that. That's the forsaken idea. But I, I think I deleted the wrong one. It goes into the Hebrew words here for forsook and scorn. So you got uh, Natash. It could mean to abandon even, to cast aside, all of these. Uh, then we got our word apostasy, right? And in 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, 3, it could be translated as departure as well. So you can see right here the apostasia, the word for apostasy, is has these Hebrew words behind it, which relate to rebellion. Uh, so then you go to the root, apostemi, and you can see the relationship to histemi. And then you go to, here it is, Numbers 32, 15. Uh, then he forsook God and made him. That's the Natash. And scorned the rock of his salvation. That's the Nabal. Um then in Deuteronomy 32 in the Septuagint, the Greek word for forsook is eg kata lepo. All right. Lepo's fall, right? And then he drew away. Aphistomy. You hear it? Aphistomy. Then you go, and here's the word that uh ag kata lepo, and you see all the words behind it, and you see that Natash. That word that was used earlier for forsake is being used right there. So here's the places it occurs in the Bible. Um, as you see, it happens in Hebrews 10.25, as well as Hebrews 3, I mean 13.5. Um, so Hebrews uh, 10.25, not forsaking our own assembling together. So that's the idea. That's the word there. And then... Uh, so he's talking about temporal judgment there. And he says, I will never desert you, nor will I forsake you. So that's the same word being used there, which is related to Joshua 1, 5, whenever he's talking about going into the land. Uh, it says, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. So it's basically, I got your back. That's the idea. Be strong, courageous for you. Give this people possession. So that relates to rewards. So it's sort of like an exhortation. Just as Joshua is exhorting them, the book of Hebrews is exhorting them. Deuteronomy 31, be strong, uh, uh, courageous. Do not be afraid to tremble them. For the Lord your God is one that goes with you, not fail, forsake you. 
The Lord is the one that goes ahead of you. He went up, uh, he will be with you. Do not fear or be dismayed. So this is kind of like the captain of salvation argument. And even Joshua is mentioned in the rest passage. So this is from Josephus to support the idea of who all died during that time, that there was a fire that destroyed the temple. Um, it's talking about the judgment and the wrath that was going on at that time. Um, so, and then this goes into Lexham Bible Dictionary, goes in more detail about it. Uh, Eusebius, what he's saying about uh, how they abandoned things. Um, talking about the destruction and the flames that happened in 70 AD, because I'm arguing that it's possible that the fire in Hebrews 10 is related to 70 AD. So, um, in the four views of the warning passages that Bateman edited, you have this statement here, the war of the Jews against the Romans, so quoting Josephus. So the idea is in Hebrews, if they failed to heed the warning, the history testifies the severity of the physical punishment. So that could be tied to 70 AD. Uh, Arnold Frutenbaum, uh, Dr. Frutenbaum's Messianic commentary, he's a Jewish Christian, uh, makes the argument about... Um, from Josephus, Hegesippus, and Eusebius, uh, that uh, it, it says right here, over 20,000 alone lived in Jerusalem at that time. Uh, they left the country, crossed the Jordan River, East Bank, and went up to the city of Pella. A total of 1 million, I guess 1 million, 1,000 is how we say it, were killed in the Roman conflict. I'll just say 1 million. These three writers indicate not a single Jewish believer lost his life in the conflict because of the obedience. So they fled whenever these 1 million died. Um, Isaiah 26, which is quoted in Hebrews 10, O Lord, your hand is lifted up, yet they do not see it. They see your zeal for the people and are put to shame. Indeed, indeed, fire would devour your enemies. A believer can be an enemy of the Lord if they're in divine discipline as well. And so this is talking about temporal judgment. It's related to the tribulation. Um, Deuteronomy 17, 16, talking about the evidence of two or three witnesses putting someone to death. That's a capital punishment idea. This is Constable's notes supporting the arguments, kind of like I'm saying about the divine discipline and, and stuff like that. Um, fire. Deuteronomy 32, uh, how it relates to apostatizing and chastisement. In Hebrews 10, it talks about once for all sanctification. Um, and so, you know, there's the argument for that, that these are true believers. You got the passage linked to Deuteronomy 32 here. Um, temporal judgment, same thing there. Much severe punishment rather than the loss of the land would be the loss of ruling and reigning in a millennial kingdom or loss of temporal or physical death. Um, so this was my opening statement in my very first debate with Daniel Muir, which he his big issue was Hebrews 10. So I made that argument you know, that, that I've just made with y'all. Hebrews 3 and 4 refers back to Kadesh Barnea, which is Numbers 13 and 14. No wonder that Numbers 15, where the sin and willfully passage occurs, occurs after that. This refers to sins deserving capital punishment or perhaps excommunication. Okay? So, the question to consider is, is Moses eternally secure now? You know, is Moses in heaven? So the promised land is not a picture of heaven or else Moses won't be there. The book of Hebrews is not warning that people will not make it to heaven. The promised land in the book of Hebrews is not heaven. It includes a warning to divine discipline and loss of blessing and inheritance. Okay, so Hebrews 10, 23, right? And it says, encourage one another as more as you see the day drawn near. Well, what day is this? Is this the day of the second return of Christ or is this 70 AD temporal judgment or both? Um, 1027, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and fury of fire, which will consume the adversaries. Was this 70 AD or the future? You know, um, like I said, the temple was destroyed in fire. Um, fire is a metonymy for divine discipline as well. We saw those passages that relate to that. So anyone who sets aside the law of Moses dies physical, right? With two or three witnesses. But a severe punishment is rather than loss of physical temporal death is the loss of eternal rewards, okay? 
And there is people say, well, there's no way there's rewards in that passage. Oh, yeah. Well, look here. 1035. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. Right. This is the eternal reward. For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And you could you could put this in your mind. It's like the land or the inheritance there. Also, one person sins unintentionally, then he shall offer a, a one-year-old female goat for a sin offering. In other words, if you did an unintentional sin, not a sin on the high hand, there remained a sacrifice, and therefore temporal forgiveness was given. But for those that sin defiantly, the sin of the high hand, or presumptuously, or sin willfully, then uh, there's no sacrifice. It can't be reversed. It, it results in physical death or excommunication. So that's what I think Hebrews 10 is arguing, that the no sacrifice is not saying you're not saved anymore. You're not underneath Jesus' blood. It's saying that you're underneath divine discipline and you can't reverse what it is because you can't offer a sacrifice for that. You know, it's using this as a metaphor of autonomy, as I've said before. So temporal capital crimes have no sacrifice. So there's no way to rectify the situation. This may help a person understand why it says in Hebrews 6, and they have fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. Well, if it's, a, if it's a sin of the high hand, then there's no sacrifice for it. There's no way to renew them again to repentance in the metaphor. All right, so what, support an idea that riches uh, or inheritance or rewards is in view. You see right here, Hebrews eleven twenty six talking about Moses. Consider the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasure of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. And then this is the statement about Moses in contrast to the eternal reward, which is not Moses, you know, support for that. So you can run things through the chart and you see that these passages in uh, Hebrews are primarily experiential. Um, so warnings apply to believers. Uh, and I, of course, agree that the warnings are to believers. The falling away does happen, according to Lucas. Uh, I say the falling away can happen, okay? But it's not falling away from salvation. Um, falling away uh, is not just disobedience, must, but must be total unbelief in the gospel or choosing not to follow Christ anymore, believing him, I guess. But I'm saying idolatry is disobedience. And what's ironic is that whenever you try to offer a sacrifice for the wrong reason, it becomes an idol. Okay? And so total unbelief of the gospel, well, if you return to Judaism, that does the same thing. So there is arguments that a Christian can apostatize in the book of Hebrews. Um, so Lucas thinks that I must prove apostasy is not loss of salvation. Well, I said that wrong. Um, prove must prove apostasy is loss of salvation. I got to fix that. But even in my position, no, that's not necessarily true. I mean, you have Gleason who's reform and you have Ryrie who takes a hypothetical argument. Those are not the views I take, but there's other ways to deal with it. You know, whenever I did those debates on Hebrews, the main reason I wanted to do it because it put the debate on record. And that way others would think twice before jumping in the Hebrews, you know, that they could actually study the Hebrews debates and understand what's going on. So Lucas would say that these passages are real warnings for believers and unbelievers. Well, actually, he would say for believers, not unbelievers. This is Dan Chapel's position and that the warnings about hell. And I would say no real warnings for believers that relate to temporal judgment. So this is talking about preparation and stuff. Um, that's not really important, but this right here, it, uh, how do you take the participle on Hebrews 6.6, 6, which we'll deal with later. In Deuteronomy 32, there's the words used uh, in the Greek. We've already kind of dealt with that. Um, so now we're back to the chart. Uh, we already kind of dealt with that one. John 10, 21, he says, may believe, but by believing. And so that makes me wonder, what's the syntax going there? And there's a variant there that argues to continue to believe. He quoted 1 Corinthians 1, 21. I haven't looked at that one yet, uh, at least right now. Uh, Romans 4, 16, I still need to look up. Colossians 2, 5 probably talks about positional raising up, but it may be experiential. I don't know. Galatians 3, 26, sons of God. I think I argued that it was experiential, but it could be positional. So 
the thing is, is that he believes that believers can stop believing. And I agree. Believers can stop believing. So one way to put it in cliche is you can lose your faith, but you can't lose your salvation. And so in support for his argument about 1 Corinthians 15, 2, being saved or in vain, meaning true faith, uh, he quoted the Calvinist Robert L. Raymond. I haven't researched him yet. Uh, Hebrews 3.12 talks about the warning of unbelief, and I agree. It's experiential unbelief. Hebrews 10.26 and 27, as I said, that's a metonymy for divine discipline. I agree. Hebrews 3.1 addresses the unbelievers. Hebrews 10.38, the righteous one. Habakkuk 2.4. I, that draws back or does not draw back or that's possibly could draw back. Uh, I take those are all experiential. Romans 3, 4 is mentioned again. And we looked that up. Hebrews 10, 39, need to look up. I'll probably put these in order if I get enough time. He would take perdition to referring to hell. I take it to referring to temporal judgment. I've already dealt with 1 Timothy 1, 19 and 20. That's experiential. So we're going through all the passages that he brought up in his opening against the reform guy. Uh, Luke 8, 13, that's about the sons of the kingdom. We can talk about that. John 15, 2, that's just about taking away the branch. No problem there. Hebrews 6, I agree. 2, 9, these people are believers. They have tasted. 1 John 2, 19, he takes as referring to identifying false antichrists. And I agree. I would even say they're false apostles related to the Gnostics and all that. And Revelation supports that argument. 1 Corinthians 1, 18, it talks about being saved and perishing. Maybe that's experiential because there is a passage that says, our outward man is perishing, our inward man is being renewed day by day. But I still need to look at that. He quoted John 5, 24. Um, and I know he's probably going to argue from the participle continuous belief, and we can deal with that. John 3, 36, that's where the word obey is being used, which we've already dealt with. 10, 28, you know, that's related to, you know, no one can pluck them out of my hand. I take John 10 as experiential. That's a whole nother can of worms. Not sure I want to open that up in this debate. He says uh, that a Christian can't be unborn, but you could die. Well, the problem with that argument is can Christ die? Because your spirit is united with him. You have his righteousness. You know, he takes Jude as referred to apostates when it says twice dead. And uh, um, I, this is one of the few books that I currently take it as they're not positionally saved so i don't take it as experiential that may change in the future he mentioned second timothy 2 12 and 13 i've already dealt with that that's uh if we died with him we'll live with him and if we deny him and you know all of that stuff hebrews 3 14 talking about partaking or participants and then it has the if thing like i said that's related to partaking and being part of the priesthood service that idea right there and he says the real question of that debate with the reform guys, who are the apostates? And he says, if it, if they're Christians, then the debate's over. I say, well, hold on. They are Christians, and the debate has just begun, because now you're dealing with all the free grace issues. Um, so when he recaps his opening, he makes the argument for present tense. He argues that the passages are, are actual warnings, and, that it's, and then he makes the argument that it's logically possible for uh, a Calvinist to apostatize. And I would say, well, it's logically possible for one to temporally apostatize, but it's not logically possible for one to positionally apostatize uh, because um, you don't, all the perseverance passages deal with one's walk. They don't deal with that. And so free grace depends on position alone. It doesn't depend on perseverance as proof of that position. Of course, um, Lucas brought up Erickson as bro on support for that. He, here's the Hebrews 10 linked to Numbers 15 and the atonement. Like I said, that's all experiential. He brought up 2 Peter 2.1. Uh, I can't remember which one brought it up, about his link to an Old Testament passage. But at that time, I took that as unbelievers, false prophets. And then 2 Peter 2.22 are believers that have been ensnared in. Um and then 2 Peter 1, 3, talking about knowledge and everything. Um, I agree with that. I don't see any issues with that. He's, Hebrews 10, 29, talking about the blood of the covenant trampled or whatever. He takes Romans eleven twenty two 22 as uh, if you get cut off in unbelief, right? If you don't continue. Um, I take that as experiential. Related to service. Other passages that the Calvinists brought up were about the sealing passages. I didn't hear him address those. 
Um, then First Peter 1, 3, uh, where it's talking about kept through faith, I take that as experiential. John 10, follow, I take that as experiential. Hebrews 7, 23, saved to the uttermost, I take as experiential. Luke 22, Jesus prayed for Peter, I take that as experiential. John 17, where the world world is used right there and talking about for unbelievers. That makes it kind of sound like uh, it is positional. I have to look into that. Um, you know, one of them brought Jude 24 promise up and he said, but Jude 21 qualifies that. You know, like I said, I believe my position accounts for those passages. So there's the Hebrews passages. And then John 6, 65, therefore is not granted. As I said, I take John 6 as experiential. This is a, just a reminder about the four views of repentance in case repentance is brought up. Here's more details about that. Here's the debate with Dan Chapa over the Hebrew warning passages. This is my argument for why um, whenever you have syncretism or rebellion or any of that type of stuff right there, that's it's called experiential unbelief. And it's all one same category. It's apostasy, in other words. In other words... You're worshiping Satan when you worship a golden calf. If you turn back to Judaism, uh, post cross, same thing. If you if you don't have the right object, salvation and all that, you've turned away from that. You're involved in idolatry and Judaism. Uh, after the cross, is is just as pagan or unblessed as any other pagan religion and stuff because it's no longer the means of sanctification and things like that. I'm running out of gas here. Even your idolatry and ide uh, can be uh, your ideology, false doctrine, religious denomination, a hermeneutic, you know, those types of things like that. And first John, the last passage out there talks about the true God and eternal life. And as you know, there's wrong views about Christ mentioned in the book. He says, little children, guard yourself from idols. So this could be related to the idea of wrong doctrines about Christ can be idolatry. So you can have a wrong doctrine about Christ, and that's idolatry. Idolatry is apostasy. Apostasy is Satanism. If the issue of the perfect tense gets brought up, as it was brought up in the Dan Chapa, I had those videos concerning that and the difficulties concerning that and the classification of that. Um, so, yeah, that's all about the perfect. Once again, back to our chart. When I debated the two-on-two, -two, I brought up this about experiential faith from a Reformed guy, Michael Eden, arguing for that. Uh, what you see, and you see this with Armenians as well, you see a shift from belief to commitment, right? And so basically, it's a redefining faith. And so we'll see if that shows up. But a free grace gives people opportunity or explanations for certain passages like this, you know, that this is experiential. Uh, from James, um, the passage about keeping it in repentance, it doesn't say that repentance is uh, fruit or works or whatever. It's in harmony with oxios is being used there. Uh, if you want to go into whether the debate about what faith is, whether it's persuasion or whether it's no, no, notia senses or fiducia, you know, um, Gordon Clark argued that the volitional aspect is more in the essence area rather than the fiducia. So to argue that for faithfulness is necessary for salvation is a wrong approach. And uh, this is the debate I did on Second Peter 2 with Crimson Air. This is some of the inductive stuff I did for my old, I mean, New Testament survey, my purpose for the book. Um, some more notes or kind of dealt with that. Some first Peter stuff. I mean, second Peter stuff resources I use for Peter, um, going through color coding things to show the difference between the false teachers and the enslaved Christians. Um, yeah, lots of resources concerning that David Dunn's notes on second Peter two, the structures you see the false teachers. Um, more detail here about what's going on here. I think some of this is Dr. Dean as well. Tracing the conceptual markers, some of the illustrations are being used in the text. Utterly perish, you know, um, Balaam's even brought up, um, those things like that. Just going through the Old Testament passages that relate to 
uh, these sins that are mentioned here and the errors that are involved here. Uh, he says, there is no false prophets in the church age. Yeah, because there are no prophets at all now. There, there were at the beginning, but no more. The focus of the beginning was establishing a new church and providing the scripture. I think that's Dr. Dean. Uh-oh. Uh, and this slide is not showing up because I got the black background. So I need to fix this. And so, yeah, this is related to that same chart where it's talking about the theology of both. And it relates to that. So, yeah, I need to fix that. All right, so the word virtue, add to it, partaker of it, escaped, more things I need to add to. This is a stair step of sanctification. Um, more arte that David Dunn did. Hupa Monet, Eusebius, uh, Brotherly Love, a lot of these words here, First Peter 1 8. I probably need to move these around, talking about being short sighted. Have forgotten purification of sins. Here's the outline, Second Peter 2. Some of the Greek that goes with that stuff. Four things related to redemption. So he's given a doctrinal argument here. Um, the passages related to that. I'm just scrolling fast here. Um, all right. So what I probably need to do is I need to order these to put these underneath my slides. I think um, warnings in Hebrews. We actually have a discussion here. Hebrews, those who shrink back. Um, he's related it to that. So that's kind of interesting. The way of righteousness. What is it? Is it experiential? Um, passages to support that idea. Here's a downward decline. That's in the Old Testament concerning fools. Um, a seal, as it says, this is like the, the structure of Proverbs that relates to that. David Dunn's a great teacher. Grace Bible Houston is where he's at. So, Apanume, to be lost, perish, destroyed, died physically. So, this is where it's being used. Avad is the, the Hebrew word. You will perish or destroy among the people. Um and so they have laid waste. That's the word there, 21. Uh, and then you surely perish quickly from the land. So physically die. This is, you know, you ever heard the saying when pigs fly? Well, because the, the, the believers in the passage in Second Peter 2 are positionally eagles, but they're living like pigs, you know. Um, and so that's what that's talking about in their experience. That's what they are. And so you could be positionally a pig or an eagle, but this is talking about experientially. You, you're flying in the beginning, but the rest of the time you could choose to live like a pig. Okay. And then when you get a glorified body, you're going to fly. This is my chart. All right. So this is talking about the bot idea. Some of the passages related to that. Um, Lake of fire language, that computer two lot. I think this is from Dillo. Um, some of the passages related to that. Balak, um, Balaam, whether he's a believer, you know, that type of stuff like that. Uh, things will be destroyed. So that's judgment. Footnotes for that. Second Peter 2.20, going into detail about it. Um, about the discussion of the word knowledge, what it can mean in case that comes up. The last state, the form word. Uh, the beginning. Um, let's see what else. Okay, here's my actual passage. Uh, my observation sheets. For it better for them to not know the way of righteousness. So I take his experiential. Have known it to turn away from it, right? And then his soul has returned to the vomit. So you have the false teachers among you, who will do these things. Many will follow their their. So you can see the the change, right? In the prep and and. and will exploit you. So the there and the they is different from the you, right? And so you have this idea of physical judgment, preservation. Uh, this is experiential pre uh, preservation, the distinction between all of that. Um, indulge the flesh, they, they, right? They, all the way through. Um, these, those who barely escape, right? These are the ones who barely escape. 
here's the Greek arguments for that, how they how it breaks down some of the debate about concerning the that promising for themselves, all of that stuff, more questions concerning that stuff there. And I think we're almost to the end of the slide. Yeah, here's the diagramming for that passage. Um, and going, 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 going. And that's it, guys. So I don't know how long that took. But that gives me an idea, you know, of how long it would take if I just went through some of the stuff. As you know, towards the end, of course, I was skimming. But this this gives me something to um, decide about what I got to do. And uh, I got to cut this short. So I won't sign off the way I normally do because I have a meeting to attend to. And I got to take my mom to go get cat food so our cat don't starve. God bless, guys.